I don't see mocap characters as being actually owned by any one person. I am a part of a collection of people that are trying not to fuck up. Right. Babel, excuse me, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. Oh, no, this I don't is, care. This Go is for totally it. fine. Hello, Internet. Welcome to T-Posers, brought to you by Stretch Sense. My name is Chris. In today's episode, my co-host, Ander, and I are going to be interviewing Pascal Langdale, Hello. actor, performance capture expert, and uh, educator. He recently founded the Society for Embodied Actors. We're going to talk to him about acting. Here we go. So, Pascal, welcome to the show. Well, I'm suddenly very nervous. Nah. Isn't that what always <laughs> happens? Is, is, is like you forget that you actually have a resume until someone else kind of <laughs> says it in front of you. And, and now like, you oh, speak, and yeah. now, you've got, you have to feel like you have to represent that somehow. That's yeah. not what yeah. we're doing at yeah. all. No. Don't even worry about it. I'm that. just, I thought I'd yeah. smack I, you I, with I a bit. I feel like an imposter for much of my life. So, well, know, we're actors, so baby. Get like on. Like, oh, yeah, I did. I do do that. Get on board the struggle bus. It, 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 we're just nothing but pretenders pretending to pretend. And if you do it right, you can get paid for it. Uh, I'd argue that point. You could do it right yeah. and never get paid for it. <laughs> you could do it wrong and get paid for you, it too. Actually. I think we've yeah. seen yeah, a lot that, of that examples also... of that. Yeah. So uh, I noticed. I mean, on, on your the web page for the Society of Embodied Actors, you talk mm -hmm. a lot about um, Laban, and I always say Laban. Yeah. I've heard it pronounced any number of ways. But can you kind of like for the for the uninitiated, for those that are listening that have never mm -hmm. heard of Laban or that sort of kinesthetic acting style, can you yeah. give us a crash course on what that is to you? Okay, so Rudolf Laban or Laban um, basically analyzed movements and came up with a way of categorizing qualities of movement and how that, um, how the body affected uh, the mind and how it um, was a part of your emotional world as well. Now he's he's best known for uh, in the dance world really for. Uh, being able to uh, notate particularly classical dance. It's been used as well in um, analysis of gesture and um, because it's a way of notating uh, the quality of gestures as well. Um, but, for, but for acting, it's a rather, um, it's, an, it's unusual to a lot of Western actors to be so focused on um, your physicality. And what Laban does is it provides an entry point into training your sense of your own body in space, but also uh, your body's position in space. And from, from if, you, if you work that skill, you gain a far better control over your physicality, which is vital if your end goal is to be able to physically transform yourself into somebody else. Um, there are other ways of doing the same thing. Um, if you go into Europe, you can uh, go into various forms of mime, which would also uh, train you in a similar way. Um, but to me, Laban is a, is a, a uh, how can I put this, a, a neutral approach to physical training for actors. It, 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 because it's, it's purely about movement, um, it doesn't have the uh, background of this particular school of mime or that particular school of mine. It's neither Marceau nor is it De Cru. You know, there's a, it's, it's very, very neutral. And so therefore it's a really excellent way for actors to begin to train them, uh, train their physical capabilities uh, in order to transform. If you're that kind of actor and you're interested in that, that's what you should be doing. No, that's amazing. Um, I, I, you know, we, we talk a lot about physicality when I was studying way back when dinosaurs were alive. The old days. Um, yeah, the sun only came out once or twice uh, a month, uh, and uh, like I said, pterodactyls. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that um, what's interesting about what you're talking, it, it is a very kind of alien concept, because in American theater, uh, there's this idea of you work from the inside out. It's emotional. Mm -hmm. it, so it's, 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 it's emotional memory and all that kind of stuff. But it's exhausting. This yeah. kind of Why don't you try acting? Yeah, why don't you just perform? Um, but, it, you know, like you're, you're counting on your emotions to like drive this physical machine as opposed to thinking about external, how, how are you taking space mm -hmm. is, is how I'm kind of interpreting this. Well, it, it's, it's creating well, physiological responses to the stimuli that you're creating with your movement and your physicality, right? Like it, it's the different yeah, states of being which then influence yeah. And we never talked about emotions. any of this when we were studying theater. This is why well, it's essentially great. that's because but this is when I was studying as well. It's essentially because in in the progress of European 
uh, theatre um, and European history, uh, there's a divide between the body and the mind. You know, there's, it's, it's split into two. And in other cultures, you don't have that divide. But it's persisted into the uh, acting um, uh, methodology. And if you, if you look, you can see that mime persists, and it goes right into silent movie. And that's pantomime, right? It's a different kind of mime. It's yeah. uh, exaggerated for comedy, for um, in, uh, replacing words. Um, and for, for a brief moment in silent movie, it, it explodes. And then as soon as talkies come, it disappears. And at the same time as talkies, you have um, early Stanislavski was being taught in uh, I was, uh, I was in America. That, yeah. And that was very Freudian based for William James. So it's goal oriented action. It's semantic based. It uses words, um, you know, actioning, uh, verb words. And somehow you were meant to translate, you know, a verb word like I seduce into if I play that action, then physically it's just going to happen, which is not necessarily the case. And even if it does happen, it's likely it's going to happen as you, with your physical heritage, mm -hmm. your normal way of behaving. It's not going to be that of the character. Even the way I'm gesturing now is as me, you know. Yeah. And and uh, so so it was only later on with uh, uh, Chekhov and to some degree Meisner as well, you know, when it split off, that you started seeing um, psychophysical actions with Chekhov, for example. But then even then it stops. Even then. It takes until what 2005, I think, for uh, well, th that was the first time I wrote a paper on nonverbal behavior, for example, and right. how it related to acting. And all those studies that had been completely overlooked by uh, acting training, and yet it's a very, very appropriate thing to look at. And then uh, Kemp uh, uh, wrote his dissertation in 2010, um, and so now, now there is this growing understanding that. Outside in, inside out. I don't really like those divisions because to me it's the one thing. Right. It's it's acting, the body and the psychology uh, and your behavior is entirely interlinked. You cannot set. You cannot um, say, oh, because I'm translating these words into an action. So you still got to physically do something. Yeah. And the question is, well, how much control do you have to make that consistent, characterful behavior? And that's and that's and the reason why that becomes important is because particularly emotion capture, the lens is on that. It'll pick up bullshit quicker than any, anything. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and, and overacting, too. Well, uh, yeah. The, you know, the, the thing we talked about, because um, my whole background in uh, professionally in, in the AAA games industry and film and everything has been motion capture, both as like sitting there working as a stage tech uh, all the way through to running my own mocap uh, stage was always a question of. The, what is the concept of silhouette? How are you yeah. managing that? Mm -hmm. Are you aware of what you're doing? Um, yeah, that's and, a big one. And it's, and it's that kind of external camera, or not even external camera, internal camera, or internal network, where you go, do you know where your left hand is right now? Right. Mm -hmm. Or are you still in your head? Well, it's just, it, it's an extension of, you know, you need to hit a certain mark. Like, even when you're in film or theater or anything, you know where you need to end the scene. You know, you know, yeah. I need to be here for this fight. I need to be here for this kiss or whatever it happens to be. And then you can dance around that as long as you're at your mark at that point. It's fine. And motion capture is just that plus extra elements of your imagination sort of taking control of what isn't actually physically there in front of you. Now, I want to do something here, and I hope you don't mind, but I'm not, I'm not trying to hype. I want to, I want to jump in the Wayback Machine. Okay. And I want to actually... <laughs> exactly. Get in the DeLorean with me. Great Scott. Um, and True man. I, <laughs> I'm really interested as to how you got to where you are right as now. Yeah. So when you were a youngin, um, when did you know you wanted to get into the performing arts? Like, what was the what was the thing? Was it a school play? Like, a school play? Dance was it like? Or... Did you, are your parents artists? Yeah, like, yeah. what is this? Oh man. Okay, you ready for this? Yep. Literally, uh, we are four, ready for this. I was I was four years old. Nice. And um, my mum was a huge fan of Margot Fontaine and Nureyev. And Ooh, uh, yeah. my brother had been taking tap lessons with this um, uh, this dance teacher, and. My mother asked the question, she said, so uh, Lorraine Grayson, you know, who teaches, uh, uh, teaches your brother? Um, she was just wondering, um, would you like to do ballet? You'd like to do ballet, wouldn't you? And it was sort of a leading question. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't even know if that's how she said it. That's but I was a like, trap. Well, as, she, as, she as she hands you the tights, yeah. you want to do ballet, right? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, it, you know, she seemed to think it was a good idea. I didn't even know what it was. Right. And uh, then it turned out I was pretty good at it. Um, and uh, I had to keep it a, a secret, which uh, back in those days, you did not admit that you were a, a ballet dancer when you were a kid. Um, or you, it had certain risks. Yep. Um, but I, I got I got pretty good at it. And then I was accepted into uh, the Royal Ballet School at the age of 10, which is, you know, it's it's not a small thing. It's a, you know, 8,000 8, or 13,000 other people, you know, other kids uh, audition. And you're one of 12. Wow. But that was a brutal, nasty place, I would say. Um, wait, 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 wait. You can't just like just say that and just like roll yeah, right twelve over it. is a small number compared why, to the big wh number. <laughs> but, but why was it a brutal, nasty place? Well, here's a, here's a few things. Things that probably wouldn't be tolerated now. Um, so, according to how good you were as a ballet dancer, how how you you were placed in the class. So the further you were to the back and to the left, the more likely you would be. Uh, to be thrown out during the yearly re-audition to get sure. back into the school. Yeah, okay. Yeah. For example. Yeah. The teachers were, uh, I wouldn't say, uh, of the modern type. Mm -hmm. So they would draw blood. A bit uh, of tyrannical were, uh, stuff, huh? A little, a little, <laughs> yeah. A corporal punishment. Uh, they would draw blood. Um, they would, uh, uh, there were cases of um, uh, physical damage meted out to uh, students as well. Yeah. Um, I'd be careful because you know these are other people's stories. They're not. They're not of, course. of course, but from your personal perspective, how did you feel about all that? Like, how did you respond to all that? Um, Were you aware of it, or or is it just in retrospect? Like, keep your head down and get to the end, yeah, sort of your... attitude. No, I, no, it it, it it affected me. There's no doubt. Yeah. Uh, after two years, I was thrown out, and it was a good thing. I I cannot I cannot say any more than that. It was a good thing. It was a it was not a healthy place for me to be for sure. I've had that exact same experience. Yeah, of just like yeah. It, I'm done with this, and yeah. I'm done with you people. So if we're out, we're out. How did you make that transition then from dance and ballet into theater or performance and, and sure. acting? Because so I'm then, sure that there's I, acting I, involved I, in I, ballet. There certainly is. Oh but yeah, like, it's, it's performance. You know, art. text work and stuff. Um, but then, then I went to uh, another theatre school. I got a scholarship to go to another theatre school where they did everything. So uh, they did musical theatre as well uh, and flamenco and tap and everything. I became a very good generalist. Um, and I realised that the bits that I really enjoyed the most were the acting bits yeah. during the musical theatre uh, performances. Now, how, how old are you now when you're doing uh, musical theatre? That's, that's taking me up to about 16, 17, somewhere okay. around there. Okay. And, um, and then when I'm... I think 16 or 17, I go and see a show with Judy Dench in it. It's a terrible play. Um, but she, she has this speech at the end where she's describing uh, her deceased husband um, now. But she de describes her of him sort of washing himself with a bar of soap with a razor blade in it. And she, he's asking her to scrub him with this soap. It's a macabre scene, you know, yeah. and all the blood's washing into the shower and that. But it was extraordinary how. Just her simply, it seemed simply telling that story down stage center. And I felt like leaping out of my chair and shouting, no, stop, right. stop. Yeah. And that was magic. To me, that was magic. The yeah. ability for somebody to pull you into a story so deeply that you, that you are emotionally invested in what's going on. I mean, that, to me, that was the, the magic. And then I saw Roger Allen in a, in a, in a Shakespeare play that was entertaining and funny. And so I went back to my, my, my school and I said, right, I'm going to audition for, dra for drama schools. Um, and they didn't like it. They said, well, in which case, you're going to take your scholarship away. So I auditioned for drama schools, um, okay. got into Weber Douglas, didn't have the money, so I didn't go. But at that point, I was like, right, I'm out. So I left school at 17. Right. And uh, started working in uh, dance, musical theatre, you know, all the usual things, pantomime, commercial right. dance, the whole lot. Right. Um, and then re-auditioned for all the drama schools the following year. I think I only, only auditioned for RADA the following year, actually. It was like a final gamble, you know. Mm -hmm. Like I remember being offered cats in Germany or, uh, or going to drama school. Ein Katzen. Um, yeah, Ein Katzen. That's, like, that's not actually not uh, German at all. No. That sounds like it should be. <laughs> it should be. What is it? it? What is Katzen? Should be, uh, but yeah, it was. Uh, and then that was the that was the moment. That was the moment I, I went to Rada, and then that was, uh, and then I, I managed to get a scholarship for Rada as well. Thank God. What now? Now this is this is me leaving vicariously because as as I mentioned off camera before, this was my dream for for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, 
what what did you do to prepare for like did you have an audition set that you would just pull from as you're going around doing these auditions or did you put together something special or different i mean usually they do like they yeah, want do you, you to do, do like you remember, do you remember what your monologue. package was that you provided them for your audition did yeah. they make you do like okay yeah, one, was, one modern musical piece and then one shakespeare exactly. or whatever yeah, yeah. yeah. moliere yeah, or yeah, it was moliere. it was uh one modern two classical so it'd be a shakespeare a chekhov and then I can't remember what the modern was. I know it was a uh, cherry orchard for the Chekhov. Probably the Hamlet classic. For, um, yeah, yeah. It's I that mean, or you know, very, 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 very predictable. Yeah, yeah. But I, I was, I was, I had to audition twice for it. I didn't get in the first time. Right. And I was in, uh, and uh, yeah, so I had to do audition twice. And I was young, you know. I was what, eighteen, nineteen, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I was nineteen. And uh, yeah, I, I I hadn't gone to university. I don't have a degree. You know, it was complete. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's odd that because now everybody has degrees when they go to drama schools. But uh, yeah, you know, what's I that about? Yeah, I don't no. have a degree. Nerds. I, just, I basically yeah. I flew by the seat of my pants basically, and still am. <laughs> yeah, and then how, so how did you go from then, Rada and drama school, and then years pass, I imagine, until sort of motion capture and animation comes your well, way. Well, were you aware of Le, Le Bon? Was um, that a, yeah, was that a grad school at, or at, a, a theatre school thing? Yeah, I was, I was taught um, Laban by uh, a teacher called Katja Bloom. Um, and it was good, but the how to apply that to a character was never really covered. I found that with a lot of the physical um, physical training systems. Like, well, here's the physical training system. There you go. You know. And um, I, didn't, I didn't have... The tools, I, I, even then, back then, I was thinking, oh, this is a bit rubbish. What's this about? You know, I sort of right. dismissed it. Yeah. Um, but it was only later, as I came at it from a sort of a different route, which was I became fascinated by nonverbal behavior. And so I was studying all the time in the, in the British Library, just, just reading everything I could possibly get my hands on. And it came up. And then I was like, oh, OK, hold on. And I began to understand how it could be used. And so that's when I started incorporating it again into my technique it's my my tool bag but it took it took that for me to understand how it could be used there is there's a certain disconnect i found in training you know, in theater where there's this idea that you get exposed to things and that it's it's up to you to kind of incorporate just figure it out and mm -hmm. but but what i've always had trouble with is making those how do i like I don't, know, I don't know if you relate to this, but how do I use this? Sure. It feels like I've just mm -hmm. gone to circus school, you know, clowning. Great. What, what, how does this relate to, to death of a salesman? Exactly. <laughs> you know, and performing like a, performing a contemporary, a contemporary piece. And I've just spent, you know, uh, uh, three months immersed in Camino del Arte. Like, what? How do I? Mm -hmm. I mean, what like, is the, it, what is well, the application here? I, that I was mean, always my struggle. At least for me, you know, with my training, it was very much like. You know, I, I got trained in, in Le Bon and, and various other sort of methodologies. Um, and the one that I really connected with most was the Alexander Technique stuff. And my, yep. my mm -hmm. teacher would use the ITM method, which is very much like, okay, what do you want to do today? And mm -hmm. that's what we do. It could be something simple. It could be just sitting down or getting up from a chair. But you're doing it as you with your sort of built-in physiological habits that your mm -hmm. character might not. And that you might not need to. It's just habitual that you've built up over a lifetime of sitting in chairs playing video games or something, that your spine responds a certain way, and yeah. then if like minor adjustments that Ollie would make would then, all of a sudden people are crying. Why are we crying? I don't know. It's just yeah. weird mm -hmm. physiological shifts can create emotional responses. But, mm -hmm. but, but, and knowing that, even without the context of a monologue or, or a show that you're working on or something is still handy knowledge to have because when you're doing that, you can then think, okay, how can I how can I apply what I learned back there in that class to what I'm doing? Well, the thing that I always was interested in is now I, I really want to dig into this a little bit with you, Pascal, because I mean, for me, uh, the, the thing I realized late um, when I was actually on my way out of trying to pursue a professional theater degree um, was the all important or at least i felt it was important concept of context so you're not making those adjustments or or playing with your posture in a vacuum people are watching you're responding to them watching in nonverbal ways like there's there's like this connection in circuit and it's it's kind of 
how are you playing with that through the piece? Right. Um, that I think is kind of the missing part. You're never just by, because if you just by yourself with no, with no audience, you're rehearsing. And the real theater is when you're sitting there and there's that circuit connection, that loop, that feedback loop, and it's not like gasping or cheering. It's just like you can feel them yeah. right there. And, you know, uh, if it's not a soliloquy, I'm not even looking at them, but I can still feel and seal them. Uh, <laughs> let me flip that around. I can still feel them and I can still, quote unquote, see them. Yeah. And, and it's how that plays. And so going back to what you were talking about, you, you, you left RADA um, at what point? Like, how long is that course of study for you? Three years. Three years. And at <laughs> third year... Last last curtain of the last curtain of the season, you know, curtain comes down. You turn around and you think, what? what what's your uh, thought? I hope I get an agent. <laughs> yeah, that. Yep. I would, the first thing is get an agent, and then and then this is the interesting thing is that um, I thought I was going to be walking into a tribe of like-minded craftspeople who saw the who saw acting as a craft, a life's work of perfecting a craft, and the reality is it's not. I mean. Um, it's a business, you know. I, I remember going to the, the Citizens Theatre and uh, and being kind of. Uh, I mean, I was naive to even think that it existed, but um, you know, I realised that there was an, there was a hope, always a hope burning, that I would meet my you know my my tribe, your that, people. That it would be a creative, almost bohemian kind of existence sure. of, of you know, uh, like I don't know, sometimes in the nineteen thirties somewhere. You know, that that was some weird image that I had. Um, and it, it just it just didn't happen. And instead, you know, I I, I turned into a, a pretty standard, straightforward TV actor. Um, did lots of commercials, and, that, and, and in some ways, commercials prepared me better for mocap than any of the TV I did. In what um, way? What do you mean by that? Well, because in in the UK, uh, because we had European passports, uh, we could work in Europe, and they, we were often cast in London because there was a, a greater pool of actors there to cast from. But if you're doing that, you're very rarely using language because you, you don't speak, uh, you know, you don't speak Danish. So, uh, I mean, you may be asked to and then they dub you over, but it, it was very, uh, you know, uh, very light on the on the uh, script. So as a result, you were you were brought in and the commercial castings were largely about nonverbal storytelling. That was it. Yeah. Nonverbal st storytelling. Yeah. And so I did I did about 30, maybe 40 commercials in the space of about 10 years. Wow. And the majority of them were based on my abilities to tell a story non-verbally. And the reason I could do that was because I had control over my body. And the reason I controlled my body was because I was trained as a dancer. You know, it was, it was, it's really that line. Um, and so when, <laughs> and so when it sort of be basically 10 years later, and then I get a casting for heavy rain. So I, it's a job like, like any other, you know, that's by like Quantic, right? The, that was Quantic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was presented as a job like any other, you know, Paul DeFreitas cast, I've still got the casting sheet. Um, it was just a speech to, to camera, pretty straightforward. Yeah, I think your audition is on YouTube. YouTube. I think I've seen it. I think your audition is on oh, YouTube. Oh yeah, well, that, that was the second casting when we were taken over to Quantic to do a recall. Right, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, is, a re um, is a recall I, I a callback? I deep dived into yeah. the behind the scenes footage for that game, both when it came out <laughs> and recently in preparation for this. And it's wow. it's so funny to see what a stage looked like 10 years ago. And yeah. it's like, I, yeah, we've got we've got those machines in the back now. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? It's 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 weird how how yeah. simple I mean, it we, all looks. And we, we didn't have head cams. Uh, we didn't have head cams for a start. Um, is all you had to glue the things car. onto your onto your face, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. Jeremy Munier would put up a seven, one hundred eight or something, seventy. I don't know. I can't remember he, now. A lot. He's at Move now. Um, is he really? Yeah. 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 He is. Yeah. Um, he's in Montreal. He's a yeah. he's a neighbor practically. Um, yeah. So so when it got, when it got to to being in the mocap studio, it blew my mind, it, because here was an area where my physical appearance no longer mattered. Right. You know what what my skin my muscles really didn't really matter that much i mean to some degree they do but um the possibility of being able to behave and act as anybody else and be invisible so that anybody watching that back even if it's just a skeleton would not know it was me to me that was like that became the gold standard of being an actor 
because I saw myself in TV and I saw, well, these are all my gestures. This is how I, this is what I do. And I would right. see myself in mocap and go, well, that's me. Well, if that's me and that's not the character, then what am I betraying here? You know, I'm, I have no control over what I'm doing here. And so uh, it goes back to, you know, do you know what you're doing? Yeah. And, in, in, and a lot of the mocap actors that I've spoken to who started like 10 years ago, all of them have a moment where they look back at what they're doing and go, oh, I thought I was doing this, but I'm not, I'm doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And with that realization, you suddenly go, okay, I have to take this seriously. Sure. There's, there's no way I can get away with this, <laughs> you know? Well, and um, I, one of the challenges, obviously, with motion capture that I kind of want to lean into a little bit now with you and, and I want to get your perspective on is that, you know, when you're performing a character in motion capture, a lot of times it's to already recorded voice lines that another actor has done mm -hmm. or I, how do you feel about the concept of hiring an actor for the role in motion capture? I understand that that's not entirely practical in, from a business perspective, you can't hire Mads Mikkelsen to do idle poses for a week. You know what I mean? No. Like that's too much money to do that. I understand, uh -huh. but there is this sort of, what's the trade off between consistency of character where one performer has complete control over face, body, voice, mm -hmm. everything, as opposed to, you know, they recorded a voice line in LA, now you're gonna do body work to that. Do you still find freedom within that world or do you find that limiting in some way? And do you see, is there potential in the mocap industry, do you think, that we might be able to get to a point where we're hiring performers for the entirety of a role just like you do in TV and film, unless you get dubbed over in a German commercial or something. Mm -hmm. You know, do you see what I'm saying? Does any well, of that make sense? I, I do, but I, I think there's, there's, there's two questions there. One is, will we ever get to a point where Mads Mikkelsen will be doing locomotions, which is, uh, for those of you that maybe are unfamiliar with that, that's all the running, uh, start, stop, start to stops, changing directions, but also with every weapon that you ever hold, you might be strafing, which is like a, a low crouch, you know? Mm -hmm. And the, the answer to that is, I'm 47, I'm pretty fit. I don't want to do locomotions. I don't want to. A, a fitter stunt guy can spend two days doing that and he will be knackered. It is, uh, it is hard physical work. And even, and, and stunt, stunt people are also trained to, um, uh, to at least change their physical, physicality to some degree to match the act that they're, that they're doing stunts for, right? So it's not, it's not, that's not a foreign thing. It's an extension to me, I think, of, of, of that. The next question is, well, how do you feel about uh, a character being a split between maybe multiple different bodies and the voice? And the voice gets the credit. Um, maybe the physicality looks like the famous actor. That's whether that's, that's going to help sell the game, you know, but your part in it is, is a major part. You're the body of this, of Mads Mikkelsen, let's say. You're the body, his body, in this character and how do I feel about that? And the answer is, is that I don't see mocap characters as being actually owned by any one person. Um, I think it's a fallacy. I think that mocap based characters deserve a split Oscar. I don't think it belongs to one person. I wonder what Andy Serkis would say about that. Yeah, I, want, I do wonder. <laughs> I wonder Andy what Andy Serkis would think about. I do. That. Yeah. I, I, but he he would disagree, and I respect I respect his point of view. Yeah. And, and I, but I, I I know that I, I know that we we differ in this territory here. Um. So if you think of the Oscar clip where um, where Caesar is up against the glass wall in the enclosure, and he's he's now I know that they weren't he wasn't wearing a head cam at that point. It would be impossible. Right. Right. I know that a lot of that data was cleaned up and it was animated using reference uh, footage, trying to make it as close to Andy Serkis as possible. But I also know that there is also a lot of areas where the animator is having to enhance things, change things, move things, make discrete choices because of the medium he's working in with yeah. his or her own creativity. And so therefore, I am a part of a, a collection of people that are trying not to fuck up. Right. Oh, excuse me, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. Oh, no, this I don't is, care. This Go is for totally it. fine. Um, and so my job as an actor is to try and do as much as possible so that the animator doesn't have to clean up things that 
that he shouldn't he or she shouldn't have to yeah sure that yeah. makes sense how long did it take and for that I need knowledge to, to i need to deliver in. a performance that even in the reference that inspires them and go oh yeah that's a good choice oh yeah that's i can see where i can see where that is and so it becomes a, a conversation between me and an unknown animator I have a follow-up question. I'm interested in the history of everything. I'm interested in kind of like, how did you get to this point, right? And so being, com reflecting upon my own journey, it was, you know, I was an actor, and the reason why I was attracted to animation was a number of different dimensions there, but it was the idea that it's a continuation of the acting, mm -hmm. but it has like technical requirements. Um, and so when, when I was running a mocap stage, when we were training new, I say new actors, actors new to mocap, I had to actually go through and describe what an animator is going to do with this. Yeah. Like after you do what you do. Mm -hmm. So at what point when you were like, you were doing commercials and you went to, you, you got your first, a couple auditions for motion capture. First of all, how did that go? Did you go, what am I doing? What is this for? Or were you kind of <laughs> into it? Uh, I, I was, I can remember walking into the Quantic Dream stage and, and it being explained to me. And I, it's, it, it, there's something in me which enjoys where acting and technology mixes. Yeah. Um, that much is true. And so even, even when I walked on, I thought, oh, wow, this is, this is quite something. And, the, and Heavy Rain was a story, a narrative-based interactive drama. You yeah. know, it wasn't... It wasn't my experience of Goldeneye, you know. Right, this was a right. different, a, a yeah. different thing, right? And um, and it was risky as well at the time. There was a good chance it wouldn't land with anyone, yeah, you know. Sure. And fair play to to Sony who invested in in advertising it, you know. But it was it was not it was not the easy sell that you know when you look back and you go, oh yeah, of course it was going to do well. Yeah. Not necessarily. It's a huge risk. Um. So I felt like I was part of something that was genuinely creative and artistic. And it was a game and that the two needn't be mutually exclusive. Yeah. And when I was there, I, I, I walked up and down, you know, all the different floors and looked at how the data was being processed, learned about, uh, um, rigs, learned about, um, shaders, uh, the difference between well, I don't think I ever at that point I don't think I knew about the difference between you know bones and blends and all the rest of it. That was later. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I've always had a fascination for how what I do translates into to what the animator does. Yeah. Um, and it, it's it's kind of it's, it is a short while ago. I was kind of validated because somebody who does who's doing the mocap cleanup, you know, uh, he came to me and said, you know, you're there's one uh, there's a stunt person there's you and we love getting your data because we don't have to do much. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, have, so you just built an awareness of like a, a spatial yeah, awareness I, of where I, the cameras are. I know the basic rules. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just just like Anders said. You know, if you know if you know the basic rules, you know you not know to how include to, and not how, how to like cross your legs you know, a not, certain way. It, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and end exactly. up on the same I mean, foot. How how is this going to get blended? You right. know, how is this going yeah, to exactly? Yeah. So do you think that um, you know because the actors are always actors apparently um, are. Uh, the most, um, there's a word for Careful. this. Careful. No, 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 no. Moaning? No. Uh, moaning? Yeah, complaining? Moaning, <laughs> complaining, whinging. No, the, um, actually, in that, pro in that profession, you are completely entitled to all of that, I think. Well, you um, know what the collective noun for, for actors is? A moan of actors. Is a, oh, I thought it was a, a, moan a, I thought it was of a whinge of actors. Um, <laughs> it, all, it all works. I resent all of this. <laughs> well, it's a flamboyance of dancers. So um, <laughs> it's not. But no, what I'm saying is, is that actors uh, throughout their career take more classes and do more learning throughout their entire career than any other profession, um, regardless of location. In the US. In the, okay, in the US then. Like, if you talk to like, our good friend, um, Catherine. Yep. We just, mm -hmm. we shout out to Catherine. Ka shout out to Catherine Grant Study. That woman is nonstop no, taking every, classes, yeah. studying everything. I mean, yeah. To be, yeah. to be absolutely commended. So going into what you're talking about, do you think mocap actors need to focus on the, the method of physicality, internalizing that, externalizing that, taking space, understanding what you're doing, but also thinking about what happens after it leaves me? Do, do you think that mocap actors should be in some way kind of 
taught about the animation pipeline, like the mocap pipeline? Like, what do you, do you encourage that, or is it just do the work and let them worry about it? I think there's a, a variety of stages. So I'd say mocap acting is still acting. So be a good actor. That would be the first step. One. Train to be a good actor. The next step is to say, well, be a good character actor. In other words, because uh, you'd call that character actor in the UK. That means being able to physically transform yourself into other characters. And for that, you need proprioception, kinesthesia, and you need immense physical um, control. And that requires daily training. It is not... It is not something that you can just do. Or there's very, if you're a Mozart, fine. Right. But most of us aren't. We need to put our 10,000 hours in. And it's no less demanding than, um, than voice work or, or, or just, just method acting. It requires, in fact, I would say it's more demanding. It requires constant um, physical attention. Right? So there's that. Then on top of that, you have to understand... Uh, how to characterize things as somebody else, which is not necessarily what you've been taught entirely in, in method, because you're right. going to have to marry that physicality with the psychology of the actor. So though that's enough, that's a period of 10 years right there, right? That's enough. And then you have to understand the medium that you're working in. Just like you have microphones, you understand you have to be a, sort of a fist away from the microphone, for example, yep. depending on uh, the gain you've got. Um, each medium has its own particular rules. It just happens that mocap more routinely demands certain skills. So in film, for example, you might work on green screen, you might be on a virtual set, but it's not that common yet. In theater, you might be theater in the round, which means the audience is anywhere, yeah. but that's not the majority of theater. In mocap, that will be probably most of your experience. The audience can be anywhere yep. and, uh, and your, your physicality is your ability to non-verbally tell a story well and interestingly is important. Even the way that if you're an, an NPC character, a non-player character, and say you're, I don't know, you're, you're emptying, you're pulling a bucket out of a well, okay? If you're an NPC, you don't want to draw focus, right? You, you don't want to bring in the fact that he, you know, he's having a divorce and he's, you know, uh, he hasn't slept all night. You want to be the best draw, uh, drawer of water. Mm -hmm. Make it as clear and as focused as you can, the best draw of water. And you have to create that physical story of person drawing water from a well. If you go up into cinematics, then you've got everything else. Then you can bring in all these other aspects too. But you have to know the medium that you're working in, the role that you're playing within that story. Are you NPC? Are you, uh, are you a, a character figure that comes up and has a, has a cinematic? Um, is it a near cinematic? Because those are also another phrase you can use. But you have to understand where you slot in so you can adjust your performance accordingly. If you don't know where the audience is, what scale performance do you think is adequate and correct? Yeah. You know, and that can be a, a conversation between you and the animators as well. But this is media, uh, this is medium specific. And every medium has its rules, regulations, and constrictions. Yeah. Mocaps are just different. And it and just like, you know, uh, you wouldn't necessarily say, well, okay, um, you just go and do film. It's fine. Take the rules of theater and do it in film because it will work really well. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. Ask Peter O'Toole. Ask Peter O'Toole. Well, it's interesting that you, <laughs> that you, you talk about, you know, uh, having to understand the rules of the medium. Uh, and I'm, I think you're going to agree with me on this point, but I still want to hear your thoughts about it. Is that I agree with you. Great. Moving on. Okay, no, that's no, it. But, I mean, so, it, it was even, it, it's funny, because it was actually even in some of the heavy rain behind the scenes stuff, where the, the title of the video was Casting Real Actors <laughs> for Motion Capture. And I've always been of the that's mind that acting is acting. It's, it's, there are different rules to different mediums that you have to understand, but I don't consider doing locomotion any less acting intensive than oh. a day of cinematic work. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on that concept because th that language is throughout the motion capture world. I find is that there's the people well, that do I, I, locomotion, and then there's the actors, yeah. right? And I don't yeah. see I don't see the difference. Well, as I said, stunt people act because they act. You know, Tom Cruise's stunt person knows how Tom Cruise. Well, actually, Tom Cruise does all his own stunts. Doesn't count. But yeah. um, but you know, uh, stunt stunt people understand how it is to physically become more like the other person under extreme circumstances. And the thing is, with a lot of these things, they are extreme, 
And the more extreme the uh, situation, the more you're looking at the body, basically, its pose, its, uh, its movement, uh, for a signal of what's going on. You're not really looking at the face. Yeah. De, De Croo would, would, would back that up. That's, that was his, his approach. Um, it's, not, it's no less acting. It's just it's the focus and the demand of what it is you need to deliver is slightly different. Um, as you're strafing, can you bring in the fact that your character's, um, your character's just gone through a really rocky separation with his partner? No, the important thing, he's strafing because his life is in danger. Yeah, right. Or her life is in danger, right? Um, so, so, so there's that. The real actor's thing, I also think, comes from a, from a place, a historical place, <coughs> where I remember going around GD, uh, Gamescom in 2000 and... When was it? Oh, that's the one, that's the one in, uh, in Germany, in Frankfurt, right? Yeah. Yeah. In Cologne. Cologne. I think Cologne. Yeah. Um, it is Cologne, yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I was going around, I was just talking to people and sort of saying, well, you know, um, uh, going to games companies and discussing how to increase cross-discipline communication between, you know, actors, directors, and writers and game creators. And they were yeah. like, why? Uh, what do you mean, why? Well, if we want somebody to write, we just ask anybody in the office if they like, like writing. Oh, okay. yeah. And, uh, and it was absolutely routine. It still is routine that... Um, if you wanted to uh, get some mocap done, you'd find some one of the animators would come out there who liked yeah. who Slap liked a doing suit some on. acting. Let's do it. Uh, yeah. Assistant no. producer, or maybe a PA of a some PA yeah. who or a has, stage manager who has never. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I I worked at game studios just like that, um, and I was sorry. I'm trying to make this about me. I'm just reflecting upon what what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Is that's very much. I'll back it up. It's very much the case, and they wouldn't rehearse. You'd get this quote unquote script that morning when you arrived at the stage. And you'd spend most of the time trying to figure out, you know, what we're going to do. There mm -hmm. was no rehearsal. Um, it was very alien to someone who's used to, Right, you know, and I, I don't mean to process. suggest that, like, cinematics and locomotion are the same thing, right? Like, they, they are in, a, in the same, again, it's the medium is the same, and you have to kind of understand the rules. But there is a certain, like, I just need to get from A to B as this character and not, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and, like, and that's it. You know, th this is not something that you're going to be close up on. But my point is actually... Um, uh, taking it a step further is for the longest time game, game companies historically were doing amazing things with engineering and math they were just yeah. taking they were doing graphical representations of math and mm -hmm. then they're like oh we're going to actually have characters and Link you know and there's yeah. going to be uh, you know like Legend of Zelda was the first one I ever saw when it was like wow it's amazing um, and then they had to think about how somebody moves. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, it was just more economical to just grab the, the audio engineer who's interested and then and just, oh, we got mocap, we'll, we'll get some. And it only has been recently that people have finally, like, sussed out that, um, oh, it, it actually matters if we do this properly. Now there's expediency where, look, we just need to pick up, we, we got to do some pickups and, and I'm, you know, Chris knows how to do this. So we're right. going to throw in the suit. But when, you, when you're doing the cinematic moments, it can't just be Rodney, you know, from photocopying. Mm -hmm. It can't be just some, it has to be someone if you want it done right and, and taking it kind of seriously. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that's, also be, that's also because the technology has improved as well. I mean, 10, 10 years ago, the graphic fidelity was relatively low and, and it was... You know, it was routine that you would, as an actor, you would have to uh, exaggerate your movements a bit because the, the mocap system didn't really pick it up. And so yep. now, you know, there is, there is a debate about whether you need to slightly scale up your performance or not. And some people say you should and some people say you shouldn't. Um, but it's, it, now it's a discussion. You know, it's there just, a, has, yeah. to it's there just has to be life. There just has to be life. That doesn't mean that you have to breathe like this. You know, <laughs> you just have to have vitality to your existence, which is really just to just think about existing, and you'll be fine. <laughs> like you don't have but, to. But ex yeah. ex except, except that if you're Clint Eastwood and you're doing mocap, your whole career has been about being very still and letting the camera in through your eyes. I still think that sells story. the story. And in the context of, of everything else. So, you know, like that test where if you have a blank face and you show something horrible beforehand, you see the blank face and you think, oh, that's, that's obviously he's very upset. Which is very right. upset. Um, whereas, you know, so that's kind of the Clint Eastwood model. You can't really Clint Eastwood in, in mocap. Not really. Because as soon as you're still, I mean, truly still, and humans can be very still, um, the 
artifice is suddenly shown because you're still in an animation. All the, uh, in, in film, you have 24 frames per second. It's a liquid medium. It's based on a liquid medium, whereas mocap is a digital medium. And I think as a result, you know, okay, yeah, you don't breathe like this, but if you're not breathing at all, or it doesn't, it doesn't pick up your breathing, that can be an issue. It's interesting because, so, like, obviously in know. theater, they say that, you know, that there's power in stillness, right? There's something about Macbeth doing this monologue just standing there, not doing, mm -hmm. not rambling, not running from side to side, nothing, just standing there and doing the task. And, the, but, oh, at the yeah, same, yeah. but in motion capture, are you suggesting then that, that stillness equals death? Like, no, there, there I, what, something... what, I'm, what I'm saying is that, particularly for stands, for those moments where you are, in, in quotes, waiting for the player to, to make you do something, right. you know, uh, particularly for stands. Uh, that's when you have to think about silhouette. That's when, because that's obviously what the player is, is going to be looking seeing at seeing the character as, yeah. you know, that's silhouette. You don't really have to think about that so much in movie unless it's being pointed out, you know. Um, and yes, some movement is required because otherwise you look like a statue. Because in animation, in mocap anyway, that lack of movement suddenly becomes very, very obvious and it becomes a thing and it becomes uncanny. It's sort of uh, in, in a way that it doesn't, that doesn't occur in it film. It looks like a mistake. Well, and is, is that one of those yes. things that you think as, as technology advances and as more kind of subtle action is able to be captured, mm -hmm. is mm. that something that you can see adjusting in the future of motion capture? I don't, I don't know. I mean, volumetric, works on a different principle, but so so long as you're working on a skeleton-based animation, I think it will be a persistent issue. Um, I don't know for sure, uh, but I think because it's Just read the future, Pascal. Just read the future. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I think because it's based on the skeleton and it's digital, those two things together do suggest to me that uh, in many occasions, total stillness is death. You know, is, is, is shows the artifice. Sure. I, I think yeah. I'm just, I'm thinking in terms of, you know, like I was saying earlier, looking at, at that stage 10 years ago from, from Heavy Rain or looking mm. at, and then looking at where we are today and the sort of fidelity Big of what difference. we can capture. Yeah. Like yeah. that's, n I don't want to say night and day because it's still sort of, you know, it's, it's, it ramps up and technology is significantly higher than it was that higher. Technology is significantly higher. More advanced is what I mean. More advanced. So who knows what tomorrow is going to bring. But I did want to, I, I kind of wanted to go back um, and talk about uh, one of the reasons we know Catherine is such a workhorse and we know she works so hard is that her social media presence is off the chain. And I wonder, now that you're an experienced actor and an educator in this field, what role do you think social media has as an actor and what do you need to do to to utilize that and is it necessary yeah this is a tricky one for me it is i mean we we had modules about this in 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 theater school like we would talk about how to maintain and build a social media presence in theater school but that but that's the concept you know the idea that i mean that's actually very forward thinking i've i've yeah. I, when i got my mfa in um oh i dropped something sorry my degree um God when, damn it. when i <laughs> Uh, no, but when, when you studied that, it was, all, it was all, well, this is fine art, and they, never, they, they didn't want to sully the program with talking about the business side, which I think is, you kind of, okay, it's then kind go, of limiting, go, right? go like, be a one-man business person by yeah. running your own, like, mm -hmm. that's, I, f I feel that that's kind of um, yeah. dangerous. Oversight. It, it's, over, it's a massive oversight. Well, it's a fact of the matter that if you're going to get somebody with 50,000 followers, they're probably going to sell more tickets than somebody with 200, right? Is well, that yeah, true? So, so, so here's the thing. So a, I think there's a couple of things. One is, I mean, I don't even think that I particularly need a website, right? Um, just give a link tree, that'll be enough. But particularly if you're trying to create a profile and, and sort of establish your brand and you don't already have any kind of uh, real presence online, then you need the website. You do need to do Instagram. You do need to um, uh, put content out there to show anybody what it is you like doing and be interesting. So and get far. And yes, it is true that in some places uh, you send in your resume and the customer will say, hey, how many followers do you have? Because it is pertinent. Um, and I know that in some cases, influencers are being employed in mocap because of their ability to uh, raise uh, the profile of the product, which is no different than getting a famous actor. Right, you know, Kevin as far Spacey. as I'm concerned, it's no different. Mads Mikkelsen um, and Norman Reedus and the Funky Fetus, man. 
<laughs> I love the name of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so you're, you're, I mean, yeah, you, on, on the one hand, you are getting guaranteed great actors, or they should be, uh, because they've been validated by their success in the industry. And as a result, they have a huge following. And so that's what you're getting, you know, on the one side. But on the other side, you're getting, um, you know, if you're getting 500,000, a million people, of which maybe half of which are interested in a post about a particular thing, that has a currency. I get it. Now, I think essentially just this has always been the case since the Greeks onwards. There is the industry you find yourself in and there is the craft. Yeah. And the industry doesn't really give a hoot about the craft, except that, generally speaking, if you're good at, good at what you do, it's useful and saves money, saves a waste of time. But that doesn't necessarily correlate with your, um, your value as an asset, which is a production question. That's the industry. The only thing you really have control over, really, is your craft, is your ability, is your talent. And yes, talent in a in a small, you know, um, in a, keeping your talent away from the world is not going to work either. But that has been a, an eternal question for artists for as long as there have been artists. So really nothing much has changed. The landscape of the industry has changed. The nature of how you uh, get yourself known has changed a bit as well. But the, the industry has always just been the industry. And that was my naivety in Glasgow 6 was that, you know, I thought that the, the craft came first, that, you know, the tribe of, that was the most important thing. To me, it is. However, I can't ignore the fact that there is the industry and I have to do certain things to ensure that I work. And if that's Instagram, if that's uh, 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 posting stuff that, that I'm doing, then fine, that's what I should be doing. Being a bit of a dinosaur, I find that difficult. You know, yeah, I'm a yeah. naturally private person when it comes to things like that. But I'm learning. You know, I, I, I have to. I also have to adapt. Well, you also have credits to your name that, like, or well, exactly, that, yes, that, that have true. that give your name and credibility that up and comers just have to kind of exactly. constantly post every single day. And I, pff, I'm too private a yeah. person, man. I can't do it. Well, I, that's, I act that's the deal. a lot, but like, I'm not. I, I don't want to change who I am. And and put ah. and be vulnerable in this way, and, which, which social media is. But but you need to take a look at um. It, 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 now stay with me, stay with me on this one. So this is when I this is my coach. I'm putting on my coach mm -hmm. hat on right now for for Chris. So you got to think like Beyonce does. Oh, that's all I do. You you have to. <laughs> you got to think. <laughs> that's how, my acting technique. You got to think. What would Beyonce do? <laughs> you got to think how Bay would do this. No, yeah. the key thing is that she puts on a whole persona. So she, she goes on stage, she's not Beyonce, she's Sash, Sasha Fierce, I think she says. So she is a completely different persona in order to get her through her day. So she, she reserves herself um, and she shares with the punters, Sasha. And so I think that, because I've had this exact same discussion. That sounds so dangerous to create an alternate persona you, for yourself no, no, to control. You I, I don't want to be it. acting on that many layers no, no, in no. real life. It, it, there, it, like, this is, but this is, this is the struggle with animators and fine artists that I've, I've went to school with and that I've worked with. And I think Pascal is kind of like pointing at this, is that there's a deal you have to make with the devil you choose yeah. because you can be the internal artist and you can be brilliant and never show your stuff but you can't bemoan the fact that nobody knows who you are so what is it that you want so if you want something you have to come up with some kind of artificial construct that allows you to do the business side and unfortunately what, what is a headshot is a headshot an honest image of of me as my family know me bullshit right it's a presentation of a version of me which may have value. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I like that. I like I like learning okay. about this sort of stuff, which kind of leads me into sort of the last section of the interview where I want to talk to you about resources for up and coming actors or people that want to get a better grip of what this industry is and what it has to offer. Mm. I know you work with the vaults, which shout out to the mm. vaults and Richard and all those guys. Uh, great, great, great resource. And I know you're teaching a class in Toronto, I think, on the 4th. So if there's still time. That's right. I don't, I don't it's, know it's when this episode's going to release. It's pronounced Toronto. Okay, sure. Either way, Toronto. <laughs> if, if there's still Toronto. room, it's like, it's please like sign like up. It's sort of almost sneezing. Toronto. 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 Right. right. Okay. So, But you also just founded this, this Society for Embodied Actors. Can you explain what that is, what your goals for that project are, and what do you want to do with that? 
Well, uh, during the lockdown, the past, what, 18 months, the MoCap vaults had, was doing great in-person classes and suddenly they stopped. And we had about a thousand people, a uh, thousand students and alumni who needed some kind of, um, some kind of continuation. And so I thought, well, okay, well, I'll, I'll teach, I'll teach Laban then. Um, so I did some online classes in, in, uh, in Laban, all the barn. And they went down really well. It turned, I didn't know whether I could do it. And then it turned out that actually it worked pretty well. So then I, then I also simultaneously discovered that a certain aspect of, um, of uh, psychology validated an approach that I have that I, I, I created maybe uh, a decade ago called the psychophysical approach, um, which there's lots of different versions of it, but this is a very particular approach. And when I realized that, that was validated, I thought, well, I'll teach that as well, because I used to teach it in London. I, I actually uh, got a bunch of actors together to test out this process to see whether it worked. And I'd sort of put it on the back burner because I thought, well, nobody's really interested. I'm in a new country. It's it's you know hard to hard to sell. What's the point, you know? But when it was validated, I thought, okay, well, I'll teach that as well. So I ended up teaching both Laban and psychophysical. And then, and this is the interesting thing, is that the alumni from those classes ended up creating a WhatsApp group, and that community of people from all over the world started chatting to each other, sharing stuff, and then. And then I realized that here was the beginnings of the tribe that I always wanted. I wanted to be a part of, ah. of being part of a community of actors that believed in the pursuit of total or near total without insanity, uh, of total transformation, psychological, physical, emotional. So that somebody who knows you would double check and think, is that, is that Pascal? Is that, and suddenly mocap, I, my aim is to be invisible. I, I, the, the, the moments that I really enjoy or feel most validated in actor is when a director turns around and says, yep. Uh, so sometimes I do this sort of body matching thing. So, uh, I will turn myself into another actor's, uh, body, how they perform a particular character. Okay. So I have to take on their physicality, their gestures, their, their way of moving, walking the whole lot. It's, it's quite a lot of work. Um, but when I do it well, to me, that's like the gold standard. That's, that is the point which I go, ah, oh, yeah, I'm good at what I do. That's good. That's really good. So this society is for actors who believe in that goal and want resources and connections and conversations and, uh, and to share stuff in order to have that shared pursuit. Eventually, I want to include animators, directors, producers, because I think that increasingly, um, because of how free Unreal is and all the, the software, right. um, is that this is already happening. Um, small teams can create stuff, but they also need links to uh, creators and actors who are also writers, who understand uh, motion capture, who understand interactivity, to come on board. And so my idea is to eventually have a community, a very, very fertile community of actor craftspeople who are not so much about ego, but about total transformation and um, content creators on the other side who, uh, who see that resource as being something they can use. Um, yeah, so th there's going to be interviews with, uh, uh, with, you know, experts in various different fields, not even just in, in mocap acting. I'm looking at psychologists. I'm looking at, um, uh, <laughs> looking at uh, sort of near, uh, near experts, you know, so because it all, it all helps. Um, yeah. And that, and basically I'm giving it, uh, it's still in its beta. It's in its trial that there's, there's only a, there's the small numbers to start off with. And we've been trying to figure out what it is that we want to do. Um, I feel like it's a club in, in London. They had these, uh, you know, they had these actors clubs and they were often founded by a group of, you know, 12 actors and they were all on the board. They, all they did, they sat on the board and advised. And the, the theory was, well, if you've got actors building the club that they want to be in and you have all their friends as well, then you're, you know, you're creating something that is fulfilling a need. And, um, my hope is that that is what this is, is that this now the times that we're in this global possibility 
of having a tribe from all over the world interested and focused on the gold standard of acting, of total physical, emotional, uh, and psychological transformation. It's a, it sounds like a noble goal. I'm excited to to keep an eye on it. And to can I in. can I join? I I'd like to, I'd like to get in. No, you specifically. Well, cannot. you know, people have said certain things. I know. Well, let me. So, <laughs> in conclusion, I do want to say, you know, for it's it's been a pleasure talking to you, Pascal, and I know I think we're going to talk again next week about more of the technical side of stuff with, with yeah. me and CJ. But uh, for any performers or actors that do kind of want to dip their toe into here, this society mm. sounds like a great place to start. The vaults, the mocap vaults, uh, Richard mocap and, and, vaults, and that team, yeah. they do classes all the time. If you want to dip your toe in and get a sense, uh, the community is is pretty, it's a big community, but it's still pretty tight, I find. Uh, yep. Word gets around pretty fast. Um, and they're a super friendly, non-intimidating bunch of gang. So just, if, if that's something that you want to do as an actor, please, please, please check out those resources, because yeah. that's but, Mocap vaults, at. but I would also say, it may, if you're not in LA, uh, or any of the big sort of meccas of uh, mocap, look to universities oh, yeah. who have mocap mm -hmm. stages. Put yourself forward and say, I want some experience. Can, you know, uh, when at the end of, of your uh, year, when you're actually creating stuff, you know, think of me. And then you go in and you start creating, you, at least you have some footage, you start getting some experience, and the stakes are not hugely high. But also you start making connections with people who are going to be going to other places. Yeah, and, I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking, dude, you know, I'm thinking Bournemouth. I'm thinking Portsmouth. Well, dude, literally, thinking, my, my first uh, motion capture yeah, gig USC. I got by just emailing the Imaginarium. I just emailed them mm -hmm. when I was in theater yeah. school, and they got back to me. And that's how I met you guys. It's the same thing. These people are not unfriendly. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, like it's a, it's a cool group of people. We're, I mean, speaking as a motion capture uh, stage owner, you know, we're constantly. I mean, we, you end up having like a rep. Of of people like yep. you and Nick and uh, Nick Palmieri and Catherine, um, and because we, we know, got a rolodex of people that yeah. we know we can depend on, and it's always evolving but and always we're growing. We're foolish to think that that's you know that we've got everybody, and that we we're always looking to find out the the wonderful thing about the community that is building. Because I, I see I see this going in the same direction. Um, the tools, the bar to entry is literally disappeared. Yep. It really comes mm -hmm. down to, you know, do I have a canvas, paints, and something to look at? It's almost like that. You just need some. And, and do I have something that I want to say? Do right. I have a story I want to tell? Right. And, and actually, I think the permission has been given, which I think for the longest time, the bar was so high. Well, I guess I'm just going to be a participant sure. in, mm -hmm. in observing it. Now I can be a participant in creating. So I think that for a lot of people, uh, the, the doors are wide open, and so it's just walking through, you know. There's nothing like starting. Dude, and, and I find that, you know, the will to do it is, like, 80%. The resources are there. You can get the training, you know, and if you take it seriously, you should get training, whether that's theater school mm -hmm. or the vaults or anybody. Like, don't improvise your way through this. It is a craft. It isn't something that you should just make up as you go if you take it seriously. So that's kind of where I'm at. You got any closing thoughts? Well, the, well the, the only other thing I'd say that one of the things that you did is that you approached the Imaginarium and said, I'm interested in this. Yeah. And if they, if they take you, the chances are is that you're going to give it respect. Oh, yeah. And give the team respect as well. And uh, to me, that's been the, the thing that has been consistent with all the people that I've seen that have consistently ended up in the mocap uh, volume is because they're not jerks. No, be humble. They don't, have, they don't humble. have massive egos. They understand that they're part of a bigger process. They're willing to compromise habitual aspects of their own technique in order to serve the game, in order to serve the story or the constraints of the medium without saying, oh, I don't work like that. That's not how I do it. Right. You know? I, I think I think there's a wonderful thing about the the weirdness of the process of motion capture is that you can't hide a lack of enthusiasm for what you're doing. <laughs> you can't. If you're not yeah. there and if you haven't shown up 100%, yeah. it is plain as the nose on your face that this person is just not here today. The suits are more comfortable than you think. Yeah. So, <laughs> like they really are. It's like a nice cozy blanket. Yeah, but but I think I always find at 4, at four o'clock, generally speaking, that's when that's when you really have to pull it out the hat. I don't know why. I think it might be something to do with the infrared. I, it's basically come four o'clock. Everybody's like, oh. 
I, I find and that like everybody starts doing things in the same rhythm, you know. If you, like, if you start yeah. at nine, yeah. if you start at nine by four o'clock, there's so much just like crust built up in the suit that like you start matters, you start to get rusty. You're absolutely right. It matters what, when you do what you do. Dude, you know, if it's leg day, we're doing that first that's, thing. That's in the why Olympic divers will like. I just been watching the Olympics all day, and they like they dry themselves off every single dive because it changes. The, the way that they operate in yeah. their dive. I, I, you know, and now we're just kind of like reflecting. Now we're just rambling. Yeah, we're just rambling. I, I think <laughs> that, um, I, one, I can never get enough of talking to other actors about, no, about it's addictive. all of this stuff. Well, because again, it goes back to the idea that for the longest time, you grow up and you realize, I don't want to be an architect or a doctor or 98% of all the stuff we're talking about here in school. <laughs> You gotta love yeah. it because if you don't love it, there's too much to deter you from it. Uh, <laughs> like well, there's too much in your way that if yeah. you're not, if this isn't what you need to do with your life, then you might get your butt kicked. Yeah, I, 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 I think that I think there's there's a lot of actors in varying degrees of development. Oh yeah. Um, you know, I, I have a whole sob story about why I didn't continue on and so on and so forth. But it's like you're at varying degrees of acorn to oak tree, and it's kind of like figuring out how far you can go where you want to go um and and also finding the community of people who are going to help you get there because the whole the, the big fallacy is no one does it by themselves no nobody does there any there's no this such by thing themselves. as a self-made person in in acting i find <laughs> like you, you're absolutely right everyone's got champions you might get lucky but nah it, it's I, part uh, of well, it well, 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 one of the luck? interesting things is when i started teaching for the mocap pools i it was before i started i went and, and watched one of their classes and it was i think it was gareth that was teaching and it was weird because i would see something that the student did and i'd think oh well they need to know and then gareth would say it and it was the first time that i realized that we are we've all been individually sort of you know going through this this industry and, and learning the medium and we've all come to the same conclusions we all have similar um we teach it differently i know that i know that's the case but then you know i then work with richard and that blows my mind i learned I learned from Rich, I learned from Paul Malwini, I learned from Ollie, I learned from John Dower, I learned from everybody. Mark one of the, with his one weapons of the I learned from like... was, a, was um, uh, a guy who now no longer does mocap, but uh, he was trained as a clown. And I loved watching him work. I learned from him. There's, a, there's um, yeah, the, the idea that somehow, you know, you can uh, uh, carve a path uh, uh, into this, into the mocap industry as being a, you know, as being a solo, a solo spirit. Uh, there's a few people that maybe, maybe, you know, because they're like the Mozarts of mocap. Yeah, there's they're always going to be. Those. I mean, they exist, but that's that can be lonely. Yeah, that's not as much fun. Make it, some friends, it man. It isn't. That's why. That's why I, I I jump at any chance to do these conversations yeah. because I want to feel. Yeah. You know, you want to feel like. And like I said, I'm I. I I I, I think I think I've acted in as many games, as I've directed and. It's like my favorite. It's like my favorite thing to do is to talk to mm -hmm. other actors about their process, about what the game needs, how to get, like, what's the path to that. All of that stuff is just. I feel like. Yeah. I feel like I'm floating. It's. I, it's, I get. It's, I get the feeling, moment. Pascal. This is not going to be the last time we talk about this. Yeah, it's going to be. Great. I get the feeling. Oh, we're, I, we're I, gonna. I, we're gonna I be hope in not. touch. So. There, yeah. there will be another occasion. I of can course. guarantee. Is there of anything course. we need to make? Uh, to, is there anything we can do for you right now? Like, do you want to? Do you want to talk about like like a Instagram or website or like a program you've got coming up? Like, where 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 can people <laughs> find you next uh, who are interested in, in working with Pascal? I think just at the moment I'm 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 focused on Instagram. Uh, so far as my and that's my push stuff to Facebook. Um, I'm. I'm trying to, the part of the reason why I'm creating this uh, uh, online community is because I don't particularly want to use Facebook. I think yeah. that that's, you know, that's, yeah. that's, that's not the way things are going. It's not what I particularly want to do. Okay. I want everybody to, to con contribute their stuff and know that it's not being tracked, that it belongs to them, you know. Um, so, yeah, look at my Instagram. There's my link tree there. You can always reach out. Not a problem. Um, yeah. And we're gonna, we're, we also have cool graphics that we can put under his name. Sweet. I like right graphics. now. Yeah, right there. I, I do that. Perfect. Right there. Perfect. Perfect. Point Incredible. The, Pascal, yeah. it's been a pleasure, my friend. Thank yeah. you for coming by. It's been a real I'm, pleasure I, to I see will you talk again to you. Well. Yes, I will talk to you next week. And God damn it, I love talking to you. That's a wrap.